Hello, ma'am. Hello, sir. Yeah, it's good afternoon there, I think. Yeah, good afternoon. Good evening to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What time exactly? What is the exact time there? It's 11.59. 11.59, okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Okay, fine. So we'll start within two, three minutes. Yeah, all right, that's okay. Um, can I uh, share my screen in the meantime? Yeah, yeah, you, you can check it out. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's okay. It's fine. Is it visible? Yeah, it's visible. Fine. All right. Okay. Please let me know when we'll have to start and then I'll go ahead okay. and start. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll inform. Just one or two minutes. We'll... Sure, sure. Okay. No problem. Ma'am, shall we start then? Yes, sir, sure. One minute. Sh Shariga? Yes, sir. Yeah, you can start. Yes, sir. Okay. A very warm good evening to all. It's a wonderful day and I feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to all present. Welcome to the 85th webinar of the weekly webinar series organized by IEEE Malaba Subsession in association with IEEE Malaba Hub and IEEE Student Branch, Kame City College of Engineering for Women. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome our speaker, Ms. Manisha Manoharan, Chair IEEE Malaba Subsession, Dr. Sabik, and all participants to today's session. We have with us Ms. Manisha Manoharan is an internationally certified neuro-linguistic programming master practitioner, a trained hypnotherapist and meditative artist. She holds an undergraduate and postgraduate degree in biomedical engineering from VIT University, India. She has also been trained in body-based personality and microfacial expression calibration. She is currently pursuing her master's in psychology at the Nottingham Trent University in the United Kingdom. She has worked as a software tester and an assistant professor before landing her dream goal as a senior behavioral trainer and facilitator that opened the doors for her into the realm of psychology. It's my great pleasure and honor to invite Ms. Manisha Manoharan for today's session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. And um, so I don't have to say anything more about myself. All I'm going to uh, request you uh, right now is if, if all of you can come on camera, turn on your videos, I would feel like I'm actually talking to a bunch of people rather than just staring at my own screen. <laughs> thank you, sir. And um, also, uh, I would really appreciate it if this session can be interactive. Um, if, if you're comfortable unmuting yourself and speaking, feel free to do that. You don't need to wait till the end of the session to ask your questions or your clarifications or give me inputs. 
you can you can always go ahead and mute and speak. I'm sorry. Uh, did you all catch that, or did I like keep speaking while I was on mute? <laughs> So you're on mute. Yeah, continue, ma'am. Continue, continue. Yeah, yeah. So, so I was saying, uh, it would be really great if we could have an interactive session. And I, I, I would be starting with a very tiny, simple activity. So it would be great if you can give in your responses either by unmuting yourself or you could type in your responses on the chat box. And I hope it will pop up uh, in front of the PPT. So, um, and also one last. Ma'am, ma once again, it got unmuted. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know if it's an automatic thing because we do that in our classes. Sometimes we keep muting our professors middle in the middle of the class. They have no idea who's doing it. But yeah, I mean, it's probably the prank that's coming back. But that's okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, any any doubts, any questions, please feel free to ask. And please know that I am a learner myself. And whatever little I know, I've managed to consolidate it and bring it out here for you. So there are a lot of things I do not know. So if I cannot answer your questions to the best of my abilities, I apologize in advance, but I'll make sure I'll find out and let you all know. So yes, yeah, so let's get into the session. So the topic that I have chosen to present is human intelligence. Um, I'll tell you why I chose this topic very specifically, but before that, I have a small activity for all of you. Let's just get right into it. So I am going to be showing you some uh, photographs of people who are celebrities, who most of you might have come across and most of you might know. <clears throat> So I'm going to show you uh, some pictures. They're all put together as one collage. And um, I'd invite you to spot the very intelligent ones who are hiding in the picture. Okay, it could be any one of them. Uh, I'd invite you to spot the intelligent people or people you think are intelligent amongst them. And you could type in your responses uh, in the chat box. So we all get to know. So here you go, you've got like a number of pictures. Are you all able to identify any one of them? Some are very familiar faces, some not so much. Anybody? Yes, Ravi Kumar, sir, I see that you've unmuted yourself. I am I'm curious to know what you think. Uh, you Actually, I missed the question. What was the question, ma'am? Okay, so uh, the question is, uh, how many intelligent people or people you think are intelligent, how many of them can you spot in this group of pictures? Okay, so I, so intelligence is the point here. I would uh, like to look through it and I found everyone is intelligent. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. <laughs> what a, that, that's interesting. That's that actually like took away uh, half the load of me wanting to explain a lot of things. But thank uh, you very much. Uh, you, what about the rest of you? Could you could you please just type in your responses or you can feel free to unmute yourself and speak. Sabik sir, if there are chats coming in, um, please do let me know because yes, Sashi Tarur, um, Albert Einstein, Chitra. Chitra, great. Okay, wonderful. So I see that you're all picking up a lot of people who you feel are intelligent. Um, okay, Sadhguru, all right. Kamal Hassan. Kamal Hassan. Uh -huh. Hassan. Okay. Bahubali director. Yes, Mr. Rajmoli, yes. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi, of course. Yes. Um, sister. Uh, Each one is intelligent in their respective area. Yeah. Wonderful. 
that's the entire essence of this presentation today and you've cracked it wonderful kudos to you all right yeah. yes well, so with that being said the next question is it's even more simpler you don't have to strain your head so much the next question would be can you name three intelligent people from your own life and why do you think they're intelligent again you can feel free to speak up unmute yourself or you can send in your responses on the chat thank you so much for people who have been responding i i have i got i got the answer but i wait for the other uh, participants to come in thank you so much thank you <laughs> come on um, i'm sure you know at least three people who you think are intelligent in your life you don't have to name them you could probably say hey it's my sister or it's my friend whoever that is whoever you feel is intelligent yeah <laughs> So I think we'll have to take your response because people are, are still thinking. Do I really know intelligent people in my life? So I mean, let them think. So, but I would love to hear what you have to say. Me? Wow. Why do you think you are intelligent? No, no. Should I answer myself? You are asking yeah, me. Yeah, please. Or... Yeah, please. Yeah. See, I I think uh, with the permission of other participants, I would like to answer this question. i i feel my mother is intelligent mm -hmm. and my friend sabik is that intelligent and myself uh, we are we consider myself intelligent okay <laughs> yeah that's nice so why do you what makes you think or what makes you believe you are intelligent or these people are intelligent yeah see uh, what actually is a uh, purpose of intelligence how do we measure this uh, quotient or whatever it is named as but what, before we scientifically name this intelligence is what actually it is to it is also something like in engineering to make the things work in a proper, proper way or uh, for utility kind of thing intelligence is also something like utilizing the uh, available resources in a better manner that could be a kind of intelligence or um, intelligence is uh, to understand something and uh, decipher sorry uh, communicate to others uh, wonderful intelligence is uh, this uh, it, now we are telling artificial intelligence i'm sorry intelligence is it is first it is found in human beings of course even some animals are intelligent <laughs> absolutely some animals are also intelligent so like that so I, in this in this uh, pretext i just i just mentioned that my mother is intelligent who brought up a big family with the re available resources and uh, i have been associated with uh, sobik ji for the past few years and uh, he responds in such a manner it is something like alarm if he thinks you would like to uh, send some information he sends it promptly without any um, callers call reminders i think he, he uses his brain <laughs> wow that's nice and uh, i am i am so happy i am associated with this group today so i use my intelligence yeah simple as that that's wonderful you you pretty much uh... basically put it out there for everybody to explain why we are going to learn about human intelligence right like you rightly said there's so much talk about artificial intelligence there's everybody's focus is on artificial intelligence but how much do we actually know about human intelligence right do we really understand what human intelligence is and why is that important that question these questions have been running within me and i'm sure it's been running within a lot of people in this world so that's the entire reason why i wanted to talk about human intelligence amidst multiple videos so i happened to look through the channels just skim through the videos i saw a number of wonderful videos that were 
talking about artificial intelligence, but hey, do we really know what human intelligence is? Right. So that's exactly the reason that I picked this. And thank you so much, uh, so much, Ravi, sir, for explaining it so effortlessly. And right. for people who have named uh, three people from your life but chose not to respond, I want you to ask yourself this question. Are you one of the intelligent people? Right. Ravi sir rightly said that he, all, he considers himself as an intelligent person too. Right. But for the rest of you out there who have for some reason not responded, and I, I respect that, do you consider yourself intelligent or not? If yes, why? If not, why not? Right? You don't need to answer me. You don't need to give this response in. But I would like you to introspect on this and open your minds, open your hearts for the rest of the time that we have for this session. And whatever little information that I'd like to share with you, I'd invite you to just take it in, absorb it, and see if it works for you. If it does, great, use it. If not, you can deal with it how you choose to, right? That is also intelligence, okay? So with that, let's step into answering the question of what do we really think that human intelligence is? Before that, what is intelligence, all right? It is basically a cognitive process, all right? It's a cognitive process with an ability to do multiple things. So when I say cognitive process, I'm basically talking about a mental practice or a mental process that's happening in our brains that does a certain set of functions like thinking, memory, attention, impulse control, decision-making, etc., etc. So intelligence in itself is a cognitive process. And how is it different? Like what are its abilities and why is it so important is because it has the ability, it, it's a cognitive process which gives you the ability to identify patterns, all right? So what do you understand by the term pattern? You, you might have all used this at some point of your life, the word pattern, but what is your understanding of what patterns are? Anybody? All right, so I'm just going to answer this and I'm going to tell you, so patterns are nothing but repetitive occurrences in nature, all right? Anything that happens once, we call it an incidence. Anything that happens twice is a coincidence. And anything that happens more than twice is called a pattern. So you can look around. You could see patterns in your own surrounding, in your own room, a certain manner in which you've got everything arranged, the food that is made in your homes, the way you talk to each other, your routine in the morning till night, your thought processes. So there are multiple patterns that we are all governed by. The ability to identify all of these is also called intelligence. It is also the ability to identify, learn, understand, and communicate tangible and abstract knowledge. Uh, Ravi sir, may I please request you to mute yourself for now because there's a lot of background noise. Thank you so much. But yeah, I would love to hear your answers. So we'll keep interacting. Yes, thank you. So tangible and abstract knowledge. So most of you here are from an engineering background, right? So I'm sure most of you are familiar with Electronic circuits. So when you make an electronic circuit, this is it's something that you can touch, feel, look at, and you know what components go where and what they do and what are their functions. These are all these are tangible things that you have a knowledge of. And abstract knowledge is something that you cannot see, hold, right? But you can perceive, like time, love, friendship. Social media, technology through which social media runs, most of the information technology that we have, these are all abstract knowledges. We do not have anything that we can hold on to, but yet we know it exists. 
yet we understand it and we use it. And we use that for multiple purposes. So that is also intelligence. And then we have the ability to apply the acquired knowledge. So you've acquired all this knowledge. Now, what do you do with it? You need to know how to apply it in situations where you need to learn how to adapt to it and deal with it. So there is this very common joke that I have come across mostly in WhatsApp groups, mostly sent by men who are married. They say that never pick an argument with your wife when she's chopping vegetables. Just keep quiet and run out of the house. That's intelligence, right? Why? Because they are adapting to the situation, dealing with it. She's got a knife in her hand and any argument to raise her temper, chances are she might throw it at you or stab you, right? Even though this is a very extreme case and it's a joke, it just tells you how you use intelligence from all the patterns, your prior experiences, you know, knowledge you have gathered to go ahead and adapt to a situation and deal with it. And then intelligence, the primary reason, the primary, uh, the need for intelligence is it helps you think a certain way. It helps you act and behave in certain ways, which helps you select and shape your own reality. So now we may all have a question, what is reality, right? Reality doesn't just exist on its own. There is no rigid, there is no fixed reality that exists. Reality is what we create, right? So intelligence helps you create and select the reality that you want to live. So this is what intelligence is. And this, excuse me, this intelligence is not necessarily limited to human beings. It, it is there for every form of life on this planet. Every form of life, be it plants or animals, are intelligent beings because they all have these processes. They, they all have these abilities to adapt to situations. They, they are able to acquire knowledge with respect to climate change or the change in the number of predators or the prey, and able to adapt with it, able to live through the cycle of life, the food chain, et cetera, right? Now, what differentiates this lower level or animal or plant intelligence from human intelligence? What is human intelligence? It's a more sophisticated form of intelligence, right? And human intelligence is not limited to just one set of activities or one set of reasons or responsibilities or functionalities. And it is not defined in a single manner. It, it's not defined as a single form. For instance, if you, if you were to compare it with a dog, right? Many dog owners here or dog lovers here would understand this. You have a golden retriever, right? A golden retriever does not act and behave uh, the same way as a Doberman or a Pomeranian, right? If you see their brains are wired to behave in a certain way only. And they understand a certain aspect, a certain degree of abstract concepts. Like if you show them love, they understand love. If you show them anger, they understand that as well, right? But they do not have the ability to make complex decisions like we do. They do not have the ability to make creative wonders like we do. So this is just a very tiny comparison to show you how human intelligence is far more sophisticated than the other forms of intelligent life that we have in this world. And we keep looking for intelligent life in other planets. But hey, have we really understood the intelligent life on our, on our own planet, right? So apart from that, like I said, there are multiple forms of human intelligence that is there for multiple reasons and multiple functions. Now, this particular concept is based on the multiple intelligence theory by Howard Gardner. Uh, although there's a lot of debate around this theory and the current reach, the research shows that Howard Gardner basically defined cognitive processes, the various cognitive processes and abilities of a human being as the different forms of intelligence. 
So initially, Howard Gardner came up with eight different types of intelligence that is present in human beings. But with the advancement of science and research and psychological studies, there have been many more such forms of multiple intelligence, which we will be looking at in some time. And the beauty about human intelligence is it is constantly evolving, right? Animal intelligence or plant intelligence is designed for survival, but human intelligence is designed to evolve constantly and to go beyond basic survival, all right? So that is what human intelligence is. And like I said, these are the different forms of intelligence that we have. So um, a quick check, are you all with me? Uh, are you all able to follow? Can you please just send a yes on the chat so I know that all of you are there? A quick thumbs up or a chat, uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Feel free to stop me and ask questions if you've got any doubts. So if you wanna add something to it, I would be very happy to learn from you as well. All right, so getting back to this. So these are the different, so I've collated a, a few types of intelligence that I feel make sense to me, uh, including what Howard Gardner had proposed and other researchers have come up with. I'd start with the logical intelligence, which is the most important criteria to be an engineer, right? You need to have the basic logical and analytical skills, the mathematical intelligence that is required to engineer things. Right? So that is what is logical intelligence. Now, the thing is, an engineer could have this, and so could a person who sits at the cash counter of a supermarket or a departmental store. Right? That's what logical intelligence is. It's all about logic, analytical reasoning, and mathematical understanding and usage of the, that knowledge. And most of the uh, intelligent tests or the IQ tests that we have target this particular intelligence only, right? So that is what is logical intelligence. But as you see, this isn't the only form of human intelligence that we have. The next is linguistic intelligence, right? People like Barack Obama, if you observed in the, in the collage of pictures that I had shared a while ago, Barack Obama, he's he, according to me, he is the best speaker in the world, right? The kind of command over his language, his ability to have control over words, over his articulation, his way of speaking and expressing and communicating it, right? William Shakespeare or whoever wrote the plays and William Shakespeare decided to borrow it and publish it, Wordsworth, right? Famous novelist, Dan Brown. Amish Tripathi, et cetera, et cetera. They all have a control over words, over language, and the ability to manipulate it and to create something out of it. So that is linguistic intelligence. Next comes the spatial intelligence, the ability to be aware of, to be able to connect with spaces around us, to maneuver through that space, to create and use our knowledge through that space. For instance, Surgeons, if any one of you are uh, into are a surgeon, or if you know somebody in your family or your friend's circle who's a surgeon, you could ask them, right? One tiny move that is away from the you know desired point that can be life-threatening, right? So they need to be well aware of their space and how to maneuver through it. Not just surgeons, you know gymnasts, athletes, pilots, sailors, right? I had, I had posted a picture of a famous sailor in the collage, which I will again show you in some time. So these people, they tend to have a, a good knowledge, understanding, and the ability to navigate through that knowledge with respect to spaces and visual cues. And that is called as Spatial intelligence. Yes, Shubha Abhilash Tomi is one of my biggest inspirations. And for people who do not know him, I will show you again in the picture in a while. Thank you, Shubha. I just, yeah. So up next to spatial, we have the bodily intelligence. So the beauty of these intelligences, 
these are not clear cut. These are not compartmentalized. Like if a person has linguistic intelligence, the person cannot have logical. No, they all overlap. And a person can have more than one form of intelligence, right? So for instance, athletes like Dhoni, when he's fielding or when he's, when he's playing cricket or Saina Nehwal, when she is in her game or gymnasts or, you know, dancers, they all need to be aware of the space that they're, that they're maneuvering through as well as use their body as a form, as, as a tool to communicate, to express, to use and fulfill them for some reason. So that is bodily intelligence, right? Most of our actors, the good actors, they have something called the bodily intelligence. And then is the musical, which is pretty straightforward. The musical intelligence is it's our ability to pick up, identify rhythms, not necessarily songs or, you know, uh, you don't need to necessarily compose things, but the ability to pick up rhythms. Sometimes while you're probably working on, you know, on, on something on your laptop and you hear some noise from the background or some procession that is going on there's some rhythmic tone to it and you would like unconsciously pick it up and you know you'd probably like bob your head to it right that that says that you've got musical intelligence as well but again it's an ability for some people it is innate it is natural and they have managed to work on it and bring it out to a a magnified scale like A.R. Rahman, K.S. Chitra, and so many musical prodigies. So that is musical intelligence. Next we have is the interpersonal intelligence. The name in itself is very clear cut. It is the awareness, it's the intelligence that we possess between people. So our interactions with people, our interactions with society, our ability to become a part of a group, ability to become a part of a society, a culture, and how do we navigate through that? How do we create relationships with other people? So all this is based on the interpersonal intelligence that we have. On the contrary, we have something called the intrapersonal relationship, which is the relationship of you with yourself, right? So. Lately, I have been seeing, especially in the field that I am in, I have been seeing a number of people going through multiple personal transformations they have that are originating from within themselves. They are having a lot of self-realizations. They are being very self-aware of what works for them, what doesn't work for them, what are their strengths, weaknesses, how do they respond, what are their emotions like. How, how much do they have a control over their emotions and feelings and impulses? All these are a part of understanding you, yourself, your psyche, your body, everything about you. And that forms the intrapersonal relationship. Okay. And then we have something called the naturalistic intelligence, which is something that I primarily lack to a great extent, which I'm still working on, which I'm building. Like I said, intelligence is not something that is unique to a certain person. It's an ability which everybody can create, develop and work on. But without expecting to be as good as somebody who is already an expert at it, right? It's an ability. So naturalistic intelligence is an ability that I have been trying to work on and managed to get to a little extent. It's nothing but your ability to connect with flora and fauna, with nature, Famous geologists, famous people who worked with animals like Steve Irwin, right? He's, he's no more. But when the man was alive, especially people who, who you know, who were the 90s and above would know Steve Irwin. He worked with here, you know, a lot of crocodiles and snakes, etc. The man had phenomenal connect with animals, Right. And like that, Dean Schneider, I have posted a picture of him as well in the collage. So he's a man who is from Switzerland. He runs a sanctuary, especially for big cats. And you might have seen videos of how big jaguars and big lions come up to him and they just run and pounce on him. And when you're going to think that they're not going to like chop his head off or bite his head off, they actually cuddle and roll around. And for normal people, it, it's, it looks scary. It looks intimidating. But 
would that be possible without this man having that sort of a connect and awareness for that sort of an ability to apply his intelligence with these animals, right? So that is naturalistic intelligence. Then we have creative intelligence. Creative intelligence is usually very pervasive throughout all the other forms of intelligence that we have. It is the ability to create. It's as simple as that. People who can write stories, who can write movies, who can direct movies, who can create art, who can create various designs, etc. These are all people who've got a good creative intelligence in them. And the final one is spiritual in intelligence or the existential intelligence, where beyond all our self-introspection, we start asking, asking questions as in, what am I? Who am I in this world? What is my purpose? How do I fit into this world? What is my path? Right? So these kind of deep questions to understand what your role and placement in the cosmos and the universe is, that primarily talks about your existence, that we call it as the spiritual intelligence. So now that you have you know, learned so many forms of intelligence, I invite you to just take a moment to ask yourself, what do you believe are your strong intelligences? And what is it that you would like to develop, right? You could write it down somewhere or you could just remember it and you could work on it as and when you want to, all right? With that said, moving on, like I promised you, here's the picture of all these people, Oprah Winfrey, Barack Obama, we have Shashi Tharoor, we have even Kamala Asin and all these people and we have Elon Musk, they're all known for their linguistic intelligence, right? Elon Musk is known for his creative and logical intelligence as well. And he has a high spiritual intelligence as well, like how Sadhguru and Amritananda might have. Abhilash Tomi, the man has phenomenal spatial intelligence, phenomenal spiritual intelligence and linguistic intelligence as well. And we have Steve Urban, naturalistic, Dean Schneider over here. A.R. Rahman, Shobana, Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi, interpersonal intelligence, intrapersonal intelligence, right? And they are not separate. They have not compartmentalized all these intelligence, right? They are all blended. It's more like a spectrum. So all these people that you've just seen, right? They, they are examples of more than one type of intelligence. With that, why do you need to understand this concept of human intelligence? Why do you think you need to? Any, any, any guesses? Anybody? You could type in or unmute yourself. Anybody? Shubha. Um, then so many responses that I've seen here. Um, Ravi, sir. Shubha, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Hegde. Anybody, why do you think you need to learn about human intelligence? Why do you think it's important to understand this concept? How do you think it's going to help you? Sabik sir, Ravi sir. Guy three, ma'am. Yeah, I, I see somebody unmuting. Ravi sir, let's hear it from you. You are, you are the man of the match here. You're on mute, sir. Yeah, of course, I must not steal your story. <laughs> you no, no, now. it's like I said, this is this is a platform where we discover, where people who've discovered a certain knowledge, we share it, right? Yes, so sir. it's not about really? anybody having a limelight, so. Your lecture is really interesting and it is uh, pulling all of us and uh, we are uh, just thinking, uh, you're giving very good insight and human intelligence is the fundamental Intelligence, form of intelligence, I believe that uh, how uh, have been noticed by us and it is recorded, is history or mythology, whatever it is, thousands and millions of years. All the all this uh, background is carried till today is only because of this gray matter intelligence. So that is the importance of human intelligence. Without that, there's no world. 
Thank you so much, sir. That, that answers a lot of questions. Thank you. Adding to that, what we have, um, Zahida Rahim. Zah I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Sorry if I'm not. To make a better approach towards our dealing. Yes, of course. So with that said, we need human intelligence to survive because it, ultimately, along with the rest of the flora and fauna, we also need to survive on this planet. And we need intelligence, some basic form of intelligence to survive, right? And to succeed professionally, personally. And we become leaders, right? You don't necessarily have to lead an organization or a country. You could be the leader in your family. You could be the head of your family. You could be the leader, right? And you will need to know how to take your family forward. You will need to know how to take your group of friends forward, your company forward, the nation forward. So this demands a lot of intelligence. Innovations, intelligence, what do you do with all of it, right? One question that changed my life a few years back was when my, my, one of my mentors asked me this question. When he, when he exposed me to this, you know, different sets of intelligence that we have. And I was able to understand what were my dominant intelligence, what were the things I need to work on. He asked me this one question, Manisha, now that you know this, now that you know that you've got multiple intelligence, what are you going to do with all of it? Right? So that's, then it began, then the journey began for me. So like that, I'm sure for many people, for everybody on this world, Intelligence is ultimately to create something for yourself or for, your, for the world, just to basically innovate. It could be innovating a big technology or a device, or it could be innovating as something as simple as a certain behavior or a habit that will help you grow as a person, that will help you succeed as a person, right? It is necessary to have human intelligence. So we have equal access to opportunities, right? Many of us, especially in our country or almost everywhere in the world, we get opportunities based on our IQ, but it isn't just our IQ that determines if we are intelligent or not, is it? So it is, it is imperative that we understand this human intelligence, especially a learned, a literate group of people like you to understand what the different forms of intelligence are and how can you use this to give equal opportunities to people around us. It is necessary to grow, to grow as a person, to grow as a society, as a culture. And that's why we need intelligent, interpersonal, intrapersonal, like I said. Well-being, our general well-being. Having in, intrapersonal intelligence and bodily intelligence, we know that we can keep ourselves physically and mentally healthy. Right? So these are some examples. So you would be able to come up with many more such insights when, you, when your brain starts churning on these things. And the best part is you have rich experiences in life when you have, when you're aware of human intelligence, the different forms and what are your human intelligences, right? When I say rich experiences, I'm not talking about you going and probably living in a space that probably Ambani owns. No, not that kind of rich, not financially. That could also be one, but I'm talking about those experiences that make your life feel fulfilled and enriched. Those kind of experiences. You make better connections with yourself, with people around you, with new people you meet, with the nature around you. You make better connections when you have an awareness of human intelligence. And the ultimate aim of all life form is to evolve. And human intelligence helps greatly in the evolution of the humankind, right? So this is the reason why it is important to understand what human intelligence is. Now, going further, let's look at it. Let's try to understand this. Let's get to the point of what this session is about. Because so far, you would have got this knowledge by just merely Googling. Of course, you can Google the rest of the information as well, but those are more easier to grab, you know, obtain. Those are easier to acquire. Now, what I'm about to tell you, most of you might have come across this. Maybe some of you haven't, but for the sake of all of us, I wanted to bring to your notice 
that the biopsychosocial model it's a very interesting model that can help you understand a lot of things in life so i wanted to see if this model can be applied in understanding the human intelligence so this is what the biopsychosocial model is it's got three domains to it it's got the biological psychological and the social domain to it now when they all come together they have areas of overlap they intersect so each of these model although they exist on their own they have a certain degree of influence and impact on each other and eventually they have a certain degree of impact on intelligence as it is okay so before i get into analyzing human intelligence using this model let's look at what this model how you know a tiny bit of information on what it is so it was advocated it was introduced by somebody called george engel in the year 1977 it provides a holistic understanding of almost all concepts of life and so far this model has been used to understand mental health and uh, the different issues that are faced in mental health so this model is equally effective in understanding what human intelligence is and it is a wonderful alternative to the biomedical the traditional biomedical approach which only focuses mostly on the biological aspects alone while not taking into account the psychological and the social aspects so the biomedical approach has not been very successful as it should have been so this is a great alternative to that which answers a lot of questions which opens the opens multiple avenues for further research all right so now let's first look at the psychological aspects i did not want to put up a picture of the brain first and have your minds blown and get into a state of confusion so now let's all talk about something a lot easier to understand a lot more maybe you know instigating curiosity in people so let's start with the psychological aspects of human intelligence so this you know this pic pictorial representation that i put across this is called the cognitive the it's the basis for cognition it's the basis of basis for cognitive processes so it all starts from a thought you have a thought right now that thought becomes an action when you keep repeating that action it becomes a behavior when you have a set of similar behaviors you have a certain belief that you form out of it now when this belief is repeated over time and again in practice it becomes a value that you have right for instance right let let me let me say this um people have a value called love right love love is a value it's it's although it's an emotion people most people considered consider it as a value in their families and their relationships right how does that originate it starts with a thought that i need to make this person happy or i also i i need to help nurture a person i need to help this person grow and i also need to grow and nurture myself it starts with a thought and you start doing actions you start putting it putting those thoughts into action to express that love to build that love then it becomes a part of your life it becomes a behavior it becomes a habit and then you develop a belief that if i do these 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 things this will happen and this is good for me and then you develop a value out of it now the beauty of this entire cognitive basis is it is also reversible values can determine what thoughts you have values can determine what beliefs you have these values and beliefs can determine what behaviors you have and what actions you take and what thoughts you have so they also they also impact each other in the reverse order so the reason i'm sharing this cognitive basis is when we are going to look at the psychological aspect of human intelligence we are going to be looking at how these thoughts actions and behaviors and beliefs about intelligence come into play so let's start with one primary uh, claim or uh, a most commonly agreed aspect in terms of the psychological understanding of intelligence intelligence is considered as a trait now what is a trait a trait is nothing but 
a, a characteristic that we have that has been consistent over time, that has been consistently in use. For instance, if you're somebody who likes to be with people, who likes to talk a lot, who likes to go party or keep going outside, you like social gatherings, we, we could call that as a trait of extroversion. You're an extrovert. People say, right, hey, I'm an extrovert. I'm an introvert, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a little neurotic. I get anxious. I get scared when I'm under pressure. So these are all traits that we have. These are all characteristics that are consistently carried out over a period of time. And a group of such characteristics or traits, they form our personality. And in psychology, there have been a number of theories which have attempted to define and understand what a person is like, what is a person's personality like. But most of them have managed to give a bit of an insight into what personality is, but I wouldn't say that they've gone very far ahead. But in terms of intelligence, there is one particular theory that stands out, which is called the ocean model, the big five personality model, which I will not go into in the depth. There is one attribute called openness, or openness to experiences. This particular trait, any person who's got a trait where they are open to having new experiences, they're open to having, uh, you know, open to adapting to it, dealing with it, be it if the, if the experience is exciting or challenging, their openness to it, it helps or it aids in the ability of that person to grow. It aids in that ability of that person to acquire knowledge. It basically makes that person more intelligent. So that is what this particular trait in this theory claims. So it, psychologically speaking, if a person is open to experiencing life as it comes, open to experiencing knowledge as it comes, the person is considered to be more intelligent, right? And psychologically, how is intelligent understood is it is nothing but an integration of multiple cognitive functions, multiple cognitive. It itself is a cognitive process, but like I said, it also has multiple other cognitive functions and processes that contribute to it, like attention, right? People for intelligence to, to develop, to take over, for you to be have that ability, these particular cognitive functions are considered important as a part of our development of intelligence. Attention, right? So a lot of people, so if for an, for an example, um, I'm sure most of you here are either students or either in the academia teaching. So not all, all your students are the same. Not all of them are top rankers, right? There are students who find it very challenging to focus in class, right? It's very challenging. So they, they are not able to replicate the knowledge that they've acquired in class through studying. They're not able to do that on the paper. They're not able to focus during the exam. They're not able to remember what they have learned. So, these, so then eventually what happens, the marks that they get or the rank that they get we label them saying, hey, this person is not intelligent. This person is very intelligent, right? But why, why is this difference? Is because of these cognitive functions. So somewhere there is, a, there is a up and down in these people. People who are probably very intelligent in other aspects cannot pay attention during a class. They cannot pay attention to logical concepts, right? That over there, the logical intelligence tends to take a hit, right? It's so the same way with memory, with the language. So when I say language, it isn't just about speaking. It isn't just about uh, talking or it isn't just about listening. It's also about your ability to write, read, your ability to read, not just words, but read the body language of a person. Right? Sometimes in your home, you 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 probably uh, you know you mess up something and then you see the other person either your spouse or your parent you see them giving you one stare one cold stare and you know that you're in trouble right they don't have to say anything that is your intelligence to grasp body language so language isn't just restricted to words it is mostly also your body language and the way that you communicate 
right? Then how you plan. So it's all about how you are able to structure things in you in your mind. And how do you plan and execute it? And how good are you at impulse control? Right? We all have these impulses, right? When you're writing an exam, you probably have, I, I, I used to have this problem, especially during my math exams. Whenever I was trying to solve a very tough sum or a problem, I would start having this, you know, a fast beat song running in my head, a song that I probably don't even enjoy, that will keep going on in loop. And I would have an impulse to sit and like enjoy that song. But over there, what is a more intelligent decision? Do I want to fail in my math exam or do I want to just dance to it in the exam hall, right? Controlling the impulse, right? So impulse control is also a part of it. So apart from this, there have also been a couple of theories that have managed to link uh, what they want to say with human intelligence. I'll quickly run you through this and I'm sure most of you have heard of it. It starts to the basis that intelligence is all about shaping our reality, right? It's because our reality is influenced by our values and beliefs. Now go back to that, you know, sequence of events that I showed you. Our values, our beliefs are shaped by our thoughts, by our actions, our behaviors, right? And vice versa. So these things eventually shape our reality and intelligence is all about shaping our reality. Now, how have the two, two theories that I'm going to talk to you about, how have they managed to explain this? The first is the model of the mind. It's the psychoanalytic approach of the mind by Sigmund Freud. Although this theory is torn apart left, right, and center in the contemporary psychology world, I still believe it has a tiny bit of it that makes sense. So here... What, is, what you're seeing is an image of an iceberg. That's how Freud, Sigmund Freud, described, you know, the human mind. He, he believed that the unconscious mind, the id ego, superego, which I'm not going to get into, but he believed that all our knowledge, our memories, our ability to focus, to plan, to structure and all, they are stored in multiple parts of this ego, superego, id, right? All our beliefs, our values and all. And what is the ego? Ego is what we project to the world. The ego is how, how we manage both our impulses as well as our, you know, supreme learnings, how we put it together and how we apply that knowledge and how we adapt to situations. So it's all about, he believes that intelligence is primarily shaped by the ego because ego shapes our personality, right? So now you see this is coming a full circle. Right, your personality influences intelligence, which influences again your personality. So it's it's a circle. You cannot really pinpoint that this triggers that or vice versa. So that's what Freud managed to explain. And there came a man named Abraham Maslow, who came up with a much more sensible theory, much more optimistic, positive theory, which says that we all as humans we go through multiple levels of needs, right? We have our basic needs, the basic survival needs are our biological and physiological needs. Like we need food to eat, we need water, we need shelter, we need, we need to reproduce. So these are all... Okay, sorry, I got distracted by that. Yeah, so these are all our basic needs that we need to, we need to fulfill before we can progress as more intelligent beings. So if you see the animals, right, the lower animals, all of them, they are primarily designed to survive. They're designed for survival, for biological and physical need, physiological needs. But humans, we go beyond that. We start looking at keeping our health safe, our finances safe. We need a roof on top of our head. We need to make sure we've got a security for our family. Then beyond that, we want to have, you know, intimacy and we want friendship and we want family connections. And we want to develop our interpersonal relationships. We want to develop our interpersonal intelligence. We want to develop our intelligence of being with the nature, everything, 
then we go ahead and we start looking within intrapersonal realization and that ultimately goes up to your spiritual intelligence which is self actualization according to maslow so these theories have managed to throw shed some light on what human intelligence is and why it is important because we as humans keep evolving and this is what would be our you know trajectory we would keep evolving to become better than who we are the previous day so for that we need intelligence and this this reason being it primarily shapes our reality so that has been the psychological aspect of what human intelligence is so everybody so far um, have you been able to follow have you been able to understand any doubts so far any any questions or are we good to go if you are good to go please say yes on the chat box so i can continue with the other slides okay thank you all right so now let us uh, okay now let us look at the biological aspects of human intelligence all right i have managed to take away most of the jargon the biological jargon so people who are strictly against biology anatomy and all don't be afraid don't be uh, don't don't get scared because i've managed to make dilute it and make it as easy as possible for you to remember it so let's go ahead and understand what the biological aspects of human intelligence are all right so before i start off telling you i wanted you to understand so this is a, a section of the brain all right so what you see here there's a place called uh, you you see several markings so the pink colored uh, structure if if you've at least seen the image of a brain like how a brain looks like or if you've at least managed to touch it hold it you would know this is like that squishy part of that brain which has got multiple folds this is called the cerebral cortex i will not talk to you about the different parts of the brain i just wanted you to get used to this term because we are going to be using this going forward to explain the biological aspects so this is a cerebral cortex so it's basically that pink squishy folded structure that comprises the major part of your brain that's called the cerebral cortex okay the word cortex is what i would invite you to remember so this cerebral cortex is divided into multiple lobes or sections all right so as you can see right you have the frontal lobe as in the part of the brain that's here in front so this portion of your brain is involved in helping you to think to speak because there is an area called the broca's area which helps you to speak it it helps you to access language words and helps you to speak so people with high linguistic intelligence that area of the brain is dominant it it's very active then memory and movement right it helps you to it helps you to know where you're going it helps you to head in a certain direction then right after here you have the parietal lobe which helps you also in language in sensing te- uh, touch it helps you in knowing your space around you the spatial intelligence proprioception is what we call it you it it helps you have the spatial intelligence and then we have the temporal which is just beside both your ears over here it's your temporal lobes it it's there on both sides so this lobe is spread like this it it primarily deals with your hearing abilities all right and then we have the occipital at the back which is predominantly concerned with your vision with with how what you see how you see it and how are you perceiving it because we all make sense by seeing and hearing and feeling things right so every lobe of this cerebrum it's very important and the cortex cortex is nothing but the tissue that is spread everywhere and it is divided into these sections all right so now why is this important is because all cognitive processes take place in the prefrontal cortex which i'll show you where so this is the frontal ro- lobe and the prefrontal the front most part of the frontal lobe is predominantly dealing with all cognitive processes so intelligence primarily arises within this area and that is the reason we tend 
to say that this person is very intelligent. We do this, right? In our, it's one of our cultural gestures. We we tell them that this person is very intelligent. We don't say this person is intelligent, right? We don't say this person is intelligent. We say this person is intelligent. So we are referring to the prefrontal cortex of the brain, and you can see the part is marked in a red color. So now here in the biological basis, what I wanted to bring to your attention is. Our brain, our human brain has evolved from the rest of the animal kingdom. And we have been, lately, we have been forming a new layer of cortex on, the, on top of our brain. This layer of cortex isn't anymore related with just survival. It is about higher order thinking skills. It's all about higher order thinking skills. And if you see the brain, like I said, it has a lot of folds, right? We call them gyri and sulci. And the more the number of folds, so a person to be intelligent doesn't have to have a huge brain. The person has to have multiple folds. The brain needs to be folded multiple times for intelligence to be higher. So with neocortex or a new layer of cortex that is being formed and developed, it has multiple folds of the brains. And how does this happen is through something called neuroplasticity, all right? A brain is nothing but tissues as well as, you know, the, the squishy tissue as well as the nerves, the neurons. These are, those are tiny cells which help you, nerve cells which help pass information and coordinate how we live and function, right? So there are pathways, there are very intricate pathways that are in our brain, which are very complex, which are very sophisticated. And the more a pathway is exercised, like imagine an athlete, a gymnast who's practicing consistently every day for the Olympics, to participate in the Olympics, their particular pathway for that bodily and spatial intelligence will keep developing and improving, adapting, changing. That part of the brain will also start altering its structure to accommodate this development in the pathway. For that person, the neuroplasticity for spatial intelligence would be very high, right? Like I said, intelligence is an ability that anybody can pick up, any form of intelligence you can pick up. Now, how do you do that is by developing new neural pathways through neurogenesis. So new neural pathways. So if I wanted to become a gymnast, which is a very far-fetched goal and I'm not aspiring to, but this is just a hypothetical situation here. If I am aspiring to be a gymnast, my bodily and spatial intelligence would have to be very high. Considering that I don't have much of it at the moment, what can I do? I could start practices of basic gymnast practices or I could do yoga to gain some flexibility. So when I start doing these things, new neural pathways are being formed in my brain, which will help solidify that and over the years and time of practice, Eventually, I will reach a point where my spatial and bodily intelligence would be on the high and I could actually go ahead and do what I wanted. So that's how neurogenesis and neuroplasticity are very important in understanding the biological aspects of human intelligence. Apart from this, we also have the role of neuromodulators or neurotransmitters you might have heard these terms lately, at least during the COVID, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. These pathways are all chemical pathways that happen in our brain. Dopamine is associated with rewards, right? So let's just say that you have studied very hard for a test and you pass it and you get the top marks. You feel good about yourself. What makes you feel good about yourself? That is the dopamine that's secreted in your brain. Serotonin. It completely controls the way that your food is digested, your sleep, your moods, right? How do you see life? Are you gra grateful to life? All these things are controlled by serotonin. Oxytocin, the love hormone. Why is it that when two people out of the entire world, when two people meet, they have love, they fall in love, it's just a hormone, right? Which further solidifies a behavioral pathway. So now you see biology and psychology are having a crossover, right? So even these pathways have a huge impact on your intelligence because these pathways need to be in a certain moderated manner. Anything going up or down ha can have a significant 
effect on your intelligence, on your respective intelligence. And finally, the role of genetics is something we cannot ignore when it comes to intelligence, right? Because there are multiple genes. So there's a lot of research that's been going on now and scientists have not yet been able to identify and see that this is the gene that causes intelligence. No, there are multiple genes that are being transmitted through, through our, uh, we are inheriting it through our biological forms. These genes keep mutating, they keep changing. Our genetic makeup in itself is a huge, a huge indicator of how intelligent we are and what type of intelligence are we born with. So this is what the biological aspect talks about. So now just to refresh, I'm just gonna show you how, as I said, right, we have the neocortex, which has the folds of the brain. The brain is generally folded, the human brain. The neocortex, the blue colored portion on the image left inside, is what the human kind has been evolved to have right now. So that is the reason that we have a lot of thinkers, we have a lot of child prodigies coming up, we have a lot of innovations, we have a lot of developments in the field of science, all because people's neocortices are being developed. All right. And if you can see on the right hand side, a simple comparison of how brains of different you know, species of monkeys compared to the human brain, you can see the folds, the size of the brain, as well as the folds and the structuring of the brain is different, which clearly states our brain is a more sophisticated, you know, technology in itself that helps us to have an even more sophisticated form of intelligence. All right. With that, let's move on to the final section, which is a lot lighter comparatively, which is the social aspects of human intelligence. All right. The first important point is it's a much lesser explored avenue of study, of understanding personalities, of understanding human beings, of understanding intelligence as well. But it is equally important. All right. Let's assume you have the right genetic makeup to be intelligent. Let's say you want to have the intelligence of uh, you know, Albert Einstein, you have the right genes, you have the right brain chemistry, you have the right brain uh, structures, and you have the right belief system, you have the right thoughts coming up because your pathways, the dopamine pathways, if it, if it fluctuates, you are either depressed or you're hyperactive, right? And if you have no oxytocin pathways, you feel, you know, you feel low about yourself, all these things. Assuming all of these are in place and perfect, what if you don't get the right nurturing to become Albert Einstein? What if you don't get the right social setup for it, right? So your social aspects of human intelligence are equally important and they all influence each other and impact each other and they cannot exist without the help of the other. Right. And that is the essence of the biopsychosocial model. So now I'm just going to quickly say, like, we have a number of, uh, you know, pointers that have been listed here. The first three pointers talk about how the biological aspects and social aspects are linked. The mirror neurons, right? When you meet somebody new, how do you go make friends with them? Or how do you get into something called as rapport, right? Especially when, when you know, if, if you've seen some movies, you'll see you know, the hero and the heroine. The hero would be trying to impress the heroine. So you know, the, if the heroine does this with her hair, he would also do this. And if she does some funny or cute expressions, the hero would try to imitate those to get her attention. He's basically activating his mirror neurons in his brain to build a rapport with her, with a connect with her. So we all do this in our daily life, not necessarily attracting people, but in terms of building connections with people, right? And when our rapport increases, you might have noticed either with your best friend or with your spouse or with one of your children or your parent, you would have a lot of shared interests. You would have a lot of shared behaviors that you would do together. It's all because of mirror neurons. And we humans compared to the other animals in the animal kingdom, we have something called the spindle neurons, which are very high in number in our brain. These neurons are primarily responsible for our abilities to connect with somebody socially, right? You don't necessarily need to build a rapport with a person, but you can 
not be a psychopath in a society and live. You're able to have a very decent societal connection and relationship with people. So that helps you. So that is the biological aspect. You see how these two are getting, there's a crossover, right? Like I already said, your neuromodulator pathways. And then your behavioral and cognitive pathways as well. How, what, what is your belief system like? What are your thoughts that come? And are you able to express those thoughts? Are you able to control your impulses in the society? How is that, how, how is your expression of your belief, expression of your esteem in the society, how is that shaping your growth of the intelligence, right? So these are all interrelated. And the social aspects primarily talk about the individual differences. So we have this interesting term in psychology called individual differences, right? So there, there, there was a man uh, named Theophrastus. He lived probably 2000 years ago. He was a Greek scholar. The man had a very interesting question he asked and he even wrote a book called The Characters. Uh, he asked a question when he was living that we're all Greeks. We all have similar upbringings. We all share the same culture. We all live in the same place. We have the same climatic conditions, et cetera, et cetera. But why is it that we're all different from each other. What is that difference? Some are, you know, like in a certain manner, some behave in a certain manner. What is that different? So that is how this concept of individual differences came into play. So what, even if we are together as a society, as a culture, what is that individual difference that separates us? And what is that individual differences that help come together as a society? So these aspects help us predominantly in developing our intrapersonal as well as our interpersonal intelligence. Then the impact of the environment, right? Like I said, you can have all the things that you need to become Albert Einstein. You don't have the right environment to express that, to work on your intelligence, to make it better. How would you become Albert Einstein, right? And the demographics, you know, right? there might be, so back in Albert Einstein's day, Maybe not many people had a good logical intelligence like he did compared to the population. So he was able to grab onto his opportunities and shine. But today, there are so many young people who are way more intelligent than probably even Albert Einstein. Right? The population differences, the way your upbringing has been. Do you know that even the order of your birth has a huge impact on the intelligence that you have. If you are the oldest child in the family, if you are the youngest child, and if you're the middle child, all these aspects have a huge impact on your intelligence, on shaping your reality, because that is what intelligence is, isn't it? And the life experiences we have from the time we are, we are infants, or even now there's a lot of research to say that our intelligence, different form of intelligence, is being developed while we are still fetuses in our mother's womb. From the time we are born till the time we become adults, the different life experiences, they shape the way our intelligence changes. The nutrition, right? We were all told, uh, especially during exams, have almonds, have badam, have dry fruits, have good, have good food, have less oil, right? Because then you will have a good memory, you'll have good retention. You will be able to apply, you know, better, you know, your skills better. And I still do not know if this has any scientific backing to this, but I was told that eating a lady's finger would help me like do very well in maths. Trust me, I love lady's finger and I did not do well in math. So, but again, nutrition does play a huge impact on your intelligence because it affects your biological aspects, which in turn affects your psychological aspects. So you see, they're all interconnected. And your access to opportunities, right? We might have everything that it takes to be intelligent, to have a certain intelligence, but do we have the right access to explore and project and experiment and showcase that intelligence to the world? And our lifestyle choices, addictions, drug abuse, and the way we live, are we physically active? Do we practice certain mental health practices? Do we meditate? Do we do yoga? Do we go to the gym? Or do we have friends? Do we get together? Do we go to the pub? Do we have alcohol? Anything. All of these things have a big impact on your intelligence. 
and what kind of relationships do we have personally as well as professionally. All right. So that brings me to the end of the session with the final takeaways. I'm not going to summarize the session, but I'm just going to tell you what I believe or what I would really want all of you to take away from the session is intelligence isn't merely restricted to academic or professional success alone. IQ does not define your intelligence or does not define the intelligence of a person because it's much beyond that. And that's exactly what I have talked to you about over all these slides. And understanding it from a biopsychosocial perspective, it helps you understand people better, understand where they're coming from, and understand how you can be a better person with them. And you're also able to understand and identify, you know, different forms of intelligence and intelligence in different people, and build your intelligence by learning from them. So I believe that you can either you can learn from a famous neuroscientist or you can also learn from your milkman. Right? Everybody has some lesson to teach. And knowing these different types of intelligences, especially since you're in the field of engineering, the field of academia, I would, I would urge you to consider giving everybody an equal chance to different opportunities where they can go explore, experiment, and showcase their unique intelligence to the world and they can grow as people too. And we together can grow as a society and we can build better technologies and relationships and become better at what we do personally and professionally. And overall, we can evolve. All right. So with that, I hope that we strive towards becoming more intelligent and working on our intelligence and helping other people discover theirs and we all have a rich life filled with rich experiences. So, yes, that brings me to the closure of the session. Any questions, feel, please feel free to ask me. I'm going to open the chat box. Any questions, you can unmute yourself or you can feel free to ask me on the chat. You can feel free to share your inputs if you thought that this was this added a little bit of more knowledge to your intelligence database or did it not help? I, I'm Please give me what your thoughts are so I know and I can work on it and do a better job the next time. Um, Sabik, sir. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. People yes, have been yes, sending me messages. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm, I'm done with my session. Sorry, I think I exceeded the time limits. Okay, no problem, no problem. It was interesting and the session was very useful, like uh, thinking in that line. In that sense, uh, it has a lot of meaning. Thank you. So I hope uh, audience have not bored. That's what I feel. Yeah, it, it's very challenging because I couldn't see any of them. And so it, it's a lot easier if we can see people's faces. Yeah, yeah, it's very difficult to handle a session in online because uh, it's, it will always become a one-sided uh, effort. Yes. So that's it from my side, Diane. I think it's, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been wonderful. And I, I'd love to hear from you guys. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. That was an informative thank session. You, thank you very much. Thank you. That you shared with us. I sincerely take this opportunity to express my gratitude to you and all the participants on behalf of IEEE Malabar Subsession and IEEE SBK MCDCW for joining us. I request the participants to fill the feedback form before leaving. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot, sir, for this opportunity. And thanks to Jinesh for- Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, Jinesh really- I think I owe it all to him. him. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jinesh. So, yeah. Thank you. So I'll see you soon. I hope we could- Thank you, thank you ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. You were such a sport man of the match. <laughs> Keep up the energy. That was great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you and bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank <laughs> you.